Okay, let's talk about the muscles and nerves of the hip and thigh. We're going to take kind of a regional approach. And by doing this, we will find that the muscles in each region are in general innervated by the same nerve and have pretty much the same action. Those muscles that I will highlight that are not in that particular region we're concentrating on will have their names in brackets. But I put those in there to keep everything in context. So starting out here on the cranial hip and thigh muscles, we see the tensor fascia lata. It's not the one we're concentrating on here, but you see it there. And the fascia lata has been removed in this image so that we can see those cranial muscles better. There's a superficial gluteal muscle and the biceps femoris. As I said, we will come back to these and the semitendinosus. Now for those that are on the cranial hip and thigh, we see the vastus lateralis muscle and the rectus femoris. In case to see the other muscles, we're going to need to take a different view. Here we see once again vastus lateralis muscle, the rectus femoris much more pronounced than what we saw in the dog, vastus medialis muscle, and the vastus intermedius, I have another image that will show a little bit of that, but we do not see that here. And there's the sartorius muscle on the medial side. Okay, so all of these muscles here are innervated by the femoral nerve. And the quadriceps femoris muscles, the three vastus muscles and the rectus femoris, those are primary extensors of the stifle. Now, only the rectus femoris, as you recall, is going to have action on the hip because it's the only one that crosses the hip to attach to the ilium. And in the horse, because of the reciprocal apparatus, which we will talk about later, when we have damage to the femoral nerve, that will cause flexion of the stifle, which will also cause flexion of the hock and total collapse of the limb. Okay, here's another image here, vastus lateralis, rectus femoris, and the vastus intermedius muscle, and then just a little bit of the vastus medialis muscle. So those are the quadriceps femoris, and there's our biceps femoris once again. Okay, now moving laterally. We've got the tensor fascia lata. The deep gluteal is not seen here. I'll show you images of that in a bit. You can see some of the middle gluteal partially covered by the superficial gluteal muscle. Also in this image, it's a good image to show our caudal muscles. We'll first cover the lateral muscles and then come back to the caudal muscles. But I want to show you them on this image here. There's the biceps femoris muscle, semitendinosus, and semimembranosus. Remember the membranosus is medial to the tendinosus. Okay, so these lateral muscles are innervated by the cranial gluteal nerve. We also see that the middle gluteal and the superficial gluteal are innervated by the caudal gluteal nerve. That caudal gluteal nerve is also going to innervate biceps femoris and semitendinosus simply because we see here, unlike the dog, the biceps femoris and semitendinosus are going to extend dorsal to the tuber ischii. Okay, so those more dorsal portions are then innervated by the caudal gluteal nerve. In general, the caudal muscles are innervated by the sciatic nerve. Okay, as I said, biceps femoris semitendinosus have that attachment dorsal to the tuber ischii, and so that portion is innervated by the caudal gluteal. In the bovine, we'll see that the semitendinosus muscle does not have that more dorsal attachment, and so therefore, it does not have innervation by the caudal gluteal nerve. 
Okay, here's another view. There's the tensor fascia lata once again. This time we do have the fascia lata still intact. There's our superficial gluteal muscle, biceps femoris muscle, semitendinosis. Okay, semimembranosis is not seen here. We return the animal so we have more of a caudolateral view. There's our superficial gluteal and the image to the right. It has been reflected down to more expose our middle gluteal muscle. Now a comment about the actions of these two muscles. Remember in the canine, there's the point of rotation in the hip. The middle gluteal and the superficial gluteal both had poles that were dorsal to the point of rotation and so therefore their action upon the hip was extension. Whereas we'll see in the large animal, here we're demonstrating it on the horse, okay, that being the point of rotation of the hip. The middle gluteal muscle likewise is dorsal to the point of rotation and so therefore is going to cause extension. But the superficial gluteal, as it crosses to reach the third trochanter, it's going to be ventral to the point of rotation, so therefore it's going to cause flexion of the hip. Okay. So here now we have transected the middle gluteal muscle. We find that it has an accessory head. With some animals it can be a little easier separated than in others. When we do find that accessory head, we reflect it more ventrally down to its insertion. We see that underneath the tendon of insertion, as it crosses the greater trochanter, we're going to find a trochanter at bursa. Okay, we also have exposed here the deep gluteal muscle. Deep gluteal muscle is going to just be an abductor of the hip. The middle and superficial gluteals also abduct, but we see because these animals are made for running, they're going to have their flexion and an extension actions more prominent than their abductor action. Okay, so biceps femoris once again. Now the action of the biceps femoris when it's weight-bearing, it's going to be to flex the stifle and then extend the hip stifle and hock in the action of propulsion. When it's elevated, it's going to function in extension of the hip stifle and hock in kicking. So hopefully you do remember in the dog that it can both flex or extend the stifle as we see here. But it also extends the hip and extends the hock. Semitendinosus muscle, another primary extensor of the hip, but it also flexes the stifle and extends the hock, just as it did in the dog. Okay, semimembranosus muscle. We're going to see that it does not have action on the stifle as it does in the dog. Okay. Overall, these are primary extensors of the hip, innervated by the sciatic nerve. When you give intramuscular injections, you generally want to give it into the semi-tendinosis, semi-membranosis, avoiding the sciatic. Generally, you'll do that on the caudal aspect of the hip and thigh, not come over here to the more lateral aspect. Also, this is a good place because if you do introduce an infection into the site, there's good drainage. Okay, so this is a specimen of the bovine. Remember, when we looked at the bones, that there was no third trochanter in the bovine, so there's no superficial gluteal muscle. Okay, so here we see the biceps femoris, the portion 
of the muscle that may have been the superficial gluteal is kind of blended into the whole thing so therefore sometimes it's referred to as the gluteal biceps muscle but over in the clinics here they just call it the biceps femoris okay let's work our way around medially now here's the sartorius muscle see the gracilis muscle once again, semimembranosus is more medial, the sartorius muscle. Recalling the dog had two bellies, we only see that it has one belly in the large animal. We don't see the gracilis contributing to the common calcanean tendon in the horse, as it does in the canine and in the ox. This so now let's remove the gracilis muscle reflected ventrally. You see the little pectineus muscle and the adductor muscles. Okay, so these three muscles, gracilis, pectineus, and adductor, they are adductors of the limb, innervated by the obturator nerve. Okay, the sartorius muscle is also an adductor, but it's primarily a flexor of the hip. Semimembranosus, also an adductor, but primarily an extensor of the hip. Even though we have a reduction of muscles that adduct in animals made for locomotion, they are still very important because that's how we keep the limbs up under the animal. Okay, sometimes we get damage to the obturator nerve, and we see something like this occur. Imagine that this is a cow and not a cat, and we are out in the barn somewhere, okay? Okay, usually it's going to occur with damage to nerves in the cow during dystocia. The femoral nerve may also be damaged sometimes in this case. Because the adductors are innervated by the obturator, an animal is going to adopt a base white stance or when in recumbency more of a sitting position with both hind limbs extended forward. These cows will appear normal at a walk on dry concrete but when they run they're going to kind of spread their hocks wide and if they fall on dry concrete they can regain standing but if they're on a wet surface or a more slippery surface they have a real hard time standing and getting their feet back up under them okay this is all i have for here we're gonna catch you next time a little more distally